Okay, so if you will, turn in your books to page 37, and we're going to be picking up in chapter 3, which is entitled, I've written on the board here, Faith, Reason, Knowledge, and Evidence. Looking on chapter 3 on page 37. And we'll do a quick review as we get started tonight that um, two weeks ago we talked about the concept of pre-evangelism. And um, that's how the, our book here is broken down. Disciple making, accomplishing the church's mission through pre-evangelism, evangelism, and discipleship. So if evangelism, which is a, a phrase or, or term that we're um, probably more accustomed to hearing, if evangelism is about presenting the gospel, what is pre-evangelism about? What are you doing with pre-evangelism? If evangelism is presenting, then pre-evangelism is what? Start to, starting with the P. Preparing. So there's presenting the gospel, but then there is preparing people to understand the gospel. Um, and, and that's what we've been really emphasizing is that, uh, that it's not just enough to present someone with the gospel. They have to understand really what the gospel is and how it, how it fits in. And we talked about the parable of the sower in Matthew chapter 13 about um, how the gospel, the word of God, is the seed that is sown through evangelism. But in that analogy, pre-evangelism is the tilling of the ground to prepare it for, to prepare the ground for the seed to be sown, for, the, for evangelism, for the gospel, for the word of God to be sown, that seed. Pre-evangelism is preparing the ground or tilling the ground for the seed. Um, if you think about what were the other, what were the types of soil? So you had good soil. There's four different types of soil. What were the other three? Do you remember in Matthew chapter 13? Rocky soil. That was one. So it fell amongst the rocks. It, it was shallow ground. What was the other one? Thorns. Thorns and weeds. Um, and then what was the, the third? If I had to go back and look this up myself, remember exactly how it was worded. It fell by the wayside. And so and by the wayside, the birds come in, devour it. And that's what Kenny pointed out that really stood out to me from whatever, two weeks ago, that it was, these are those who did not, who hear the, the word, but they don't understand it. And that's what we're talking about with pre-evangelism. But I want you to think about that, that those other three types of soil, the wayside or they're along the path where the birds come in and they devour it, the rocky soil, the soil of thorns and weeds. You know, don't just think about in terms of, well, this friend of mine is this kind of soil or that friend of mine is that kind of soil, but, you know, I'm, I'm the good soul. I'm here on a Wednesday night, so I must be the good soul and my family is the good soul. But think in terms of, Soil can be, that rocky soil can be turned into good soil if it's prepared, if it's tilled, if it's prepared for the seed. And that, so think of that in terms of the thorns, the weeds, that soil that has not been prepared. That's just that, that no one's put the work in to cultivate it, to prepare it. But any of those three types could be turned into good soil that can receive the seed. And so I want you to think of it in that sense. And that's really what we're talking about with pre-evangelism, and I like what it said there in chapter 1, that most people, and by most people, it's not just most people you know, but the vast majority of people in the world are in need of pre-evangelism. They're at the point where they need the preparation, they need pre-evangelism in order to be able to really receive and understand the gospel. And we talked about, if you remember the analogy I used of like, taking three or four puzzles and putting them together and removing some pieces and adding some pieces and mixing them up, that's where most people are, where they're not going to be able to work this thing. That, that, that there's going to, You have to do some work on the front end to prepare them to put these pieces together. And so when you look at how much confusion there is, that there are so many people that if you just give them the gospel, it's not going to make any sense to them. And I, I was thinking about the, the track we made that I kind of came up with here a few, a few months ago, and I'm going to get some more of these printed. You notice on this that why doesn't this, this say... <laughs> Jesus saves with an exclamation point on the front of this. Why instead does it have a question that says, why do you exist? Yeah, the, I mean, that's assuming that somebody has some clue who Jesus is, what salvation is, what we need to be saved from. You know, that, that, the concept right of him being a savior, that's where we, we start with this because even, in, even here in the U.S., even here in, the, in, in Blount County, in, in what's considered part of the Bible Belt, you cannot assume that people understand how Jesus fits in, how Jesus fits in as Savior, how He fits into this idea of redemption, of, of God's plan of redemption and of salvation. 
so so you have to do some work on the front end on with some explanation and, and that actually goes into what we talked about last week which is common ground and and finding that common ground we can't say the common ground of you need a savior most people are not going to accept the fact that they need a savior they're going to say hey that's good for you i'm glad you found religion you found jesus if it works for you if it makes your life happier and better then you go do that but that's for you. That's not for me. They don't. The idea that they would need a savior is is lost on them. That's not common ground about what's the way of salvation. Who is the savior? How can we be saved? But the question of existence is common ground. Why do you exist? Thinking about that question of why are you here? Why do you exist? What's your purpose in life? That's more common ground. That's what we talked about some last week, where Paul's common ground. We see this in Acts chapter seventeen. His common ground with a Jewish audience was very different than his common ground with a pagan audience. And again, we see that in Acts chapter 17. The Jews at Thessalonica, Paul presented the gospel to them. They were, they were far more prepared for the gospel than the Greek pagans in Athens. And so Paul begins to talk to them about Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Savior. They have the Old Testament. They, they believe the Old Testament. And they're, you know this Jewish Messiah... Jesus is the Messiah. He's the promised one of God. He's the anointed one of God. Whereas when he talks to these Greek pagans, he's talking about what? What did he, what did he kind of start off with? It certainly wasn't the Scriptures. What did he, what did he begin with with the, the pagans at Athens? Greek pagans. He was talking about their gods. Their gods. Um, and it, the, un, the unknown God, so this, this concept, so they, they at least, they weren't atheists, they at least believed in a concept of the supernatural or, or gods, multiple gods. Um, but what else did he, get, did he go to? Creation. creation. He talks about creation, which is something that, you know, that they, that, that was the common ground with that group of these pagans was that there is a God in creation. And so we see that, uh, finding that common ground. So, Tonight, did even, first of all, do anyone have any questions from the last uh, two weeks? Anything that came to mind? Okay, so tonight we're coming to chapter 3. Again, it's on page 37 in your book. About faith, reason, knowledge, and evidence. So we've talked about the concept of pre-evangelism. we talked about common ground. Now we're talking about faith, reason, knowledge, and evidence. Uh, let me start off with this question. Can you... Can you argue someone into heaven? If you meet someone who's an atheist, if you present them with enough evidence, can you make it where they can no longer not believe? Is it possible to argue someone into faith or into, into trust in Christ? And actually, usually the way you, that you'll hear that, you won't hear the former question, you'll hear someone say, well, you can't argue someone into heaven. That's, that's the mentality. You can't argue someone into heaven. Um, let's look at John chapter 20. Turn to John chapter 20 and then turn to Hebrews chapter 11 as well. We'll start in John chapter 20. And thinking about this idea of faith, reason, knowledge, and evidence. Look at John chapter 20, verse 24 through 28. Somebody could get turned there and I'll have someone read that for us. And then also turn over to Hebrews chapter 11 and look at verse 1. So John chapter 20, verse 24 through 28. Somebody care to read that for us? So Thomas called for him, one of the twelve was not with him when Jesus came. So the other disciples were telling him, We've seen the Lord, but he said to them, If I don't see the mark of the nails in his hand, put my finger in the mark of his of the nails, and put my hand in his side, I will never believe. A week later his disciples were indoors again, and Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and look at my hand. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Don't be faithless, but believe. And Thomas responded to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said, Because you have seen me and you have believed, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. 
Okay, so yeah, thank you for reading through 29 as well. That's really the point I wanted to get to. So, Jesus says to Thomas, Because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. Okay, so with that, that statement in mind, look over at Hebrews chapter 11. It's somebody read verse 1, and also read verse 6. And this is known as kind of the faith chapter in the Bible. So I read Hebrews 11, 1, and then read verse 6. Faith, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Okay. So kind of putting those scriptures together, it seems like you're kind of left with this. Like if you look, think about the relationship between faith, reason, knowledge, and evidence, it actually would look more like this. And then this. It would be more like faith or reason, knowledge, and evidence. Based on what, what, how Christ describes that to Thomas, that it's either seeing or it's believing. That, that it is superior to believe having not seen. And you're kind of, that's where this concept of, of blind faith, it's believing without having seen. You see in both of those passages of Scripture, Jesus says, blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. Um, also the one that Justin read there, uh, 11 one says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things, what? Not seen. So you have this concept of, of blind faith that you just have to believe. And it almost seems like that, that Thomas especially is is seen as an example of this, or it's almost like Jesus is scolding him, saying, well, you required evidence in order to believe. Blessed, more blessed are those that, that, because you've been given more knowledge, there's less blessing for you because you've been given this evidence. You've seen the, the holes in my hands and in my side. But more blessed, blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. That it is superior, basically, you have to have greater faith to believe having not seen, and therefore it, it's better to have, to have more faith, less evidence, more faith. That those are kind of, they're kind of like an inverse. More knowledge, less faith. More faith, less knowledge. That's where this idea of blind faith, believing having not seen. And so is that what is being commended in those passages? And usually, if, if somebody like really gets on the ropes, if they're, if they're discussing Christianity, discussing the existence of God, something like that, and they get on the ropes, and, and usually the comment will come up, well, you just have to have faith. You have to receive it by faith. That's basically saying, you're demanding evidence, I'm telling you, you just have to believe it. You just have to have faith. That it, without, without faith, it's impossible to please God. As Hebrews eleven six says, you're going to have to have faith. And so, would you say that the Bible, and especially these passages, that this is commending blind faith? Is blind faith commendable? I think you have to go. You have to look at all of the examples that follow in Hebrews chapter eleven mm -hmm. to get your answer. And Abel wasn't doing it blindly. Did it because he knew God and he was directed by God. Noah didn't do it blindly. Mm -hmm. Abraham didn't do it blindly. Mm -hmm. I mean, every one of them had had some evidence. In fact, they had better evidence than we have. Mm -hmm. They had the the verbal word of God mm -hmm. that came to them. Is I that mean, well? Is that better evidence than what we have? I mean, we'll, we, we'll come back to that in a minute. If, but yeah, if God superior. Is, okay, Jesus appearing before Paul's face. Better evidence. Yeah. I mean, it's a one-on-one it's -on -one encounter. 
Abraham. We may have to come back to that. Yeah, but like, yeah. I mean, Abraham hears the the very voice of, of God mm -hmm. that says, "Gives him a direct command." I mm -hmm. I can say like I've I've been uh, led by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. I can't I can't quote you the exact words that God has spoken into my into my ear the way Abraham did, where God had said, "Justin, mm -hmm. get up." Get your stuff and go fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is you can't just read Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 in isolation Correct. from the rest of Hebrews chapter 11. I think that's true. Well, what about Thomas? Do you think he was rebuked because he had to see it to believe it? Well, let me, let me start with this. What is... I'm sorry. Exactly. Yep. I think you're exactly right because... And I think both of those, what you see in Hebrews uh, chapter 11, what you see in this event with Thomas, you have, there's a broader context there. And if you think about what's another word for faith? What's some synonyms for, the, for faith? What's another word for faith? Trust. Trust. Confidence. Confidence. Belief. Belief. So is the opposite of, you know, I said earlier that there's almost like there's this inverse relationship between faith and knowledge. Less knowledge requires more faith. More knowledge requires less faith, um, or, or greater faith requires less knowledge, and, and less faith requires more knowledge. So is faith the opposite of knowledge? You can kind of cheat a little bit on page 39. Is, faith, is it faith or knowledge? Is faith the opposite of knowledge? And when you think about the term belief, what's the opposite of belief? Unbelief. That's different from, what's the opposite of to, to have knowledge? What's the opposite of, if you don't have knowledge, then what are you? Unbelieving? You're ignorant. So there's knowledge and ignorance. There's belief and unbelief. There's, as also mentioned, trust. There's trust and there's distrust. And those, it's good to think of it in, that, in, that, in those terms because that really clarifies you know, what we're talking about. What, what is the, the opposite of faith? is unbelief. What's the opposite of trust is distrust. The opposite of knowledge is ignorance. So, and let me ask you this. How, if, if let's say the Bible, if you believe the Bible was, was, um, was supporting blind faith or commending blind faith, how does blind faith guard against deception? If, if, if you just have to have faith, if you just have to believe, how does that guard against it? We live in a deceptive world, and God is well aware, as it talks about in, here in chapter 3, we live in a deceptive world, and God knows that. So if, if someone said, I have, I, if they, you wanted to use that term, most people don't use that term, but it's, when they, unfortunately, when they use the term faith, they actually mean blind faith. So if someone says, I have faith that Islam is true. And you, you insert in there that they have blind faith that Islam is true. How are you going to convince them otherwise? Well, um, well there you go. But they would say, I, don't, I have faith, I don't need evidence. Let's say someone has blind faith. They have faith that Christianity is true. They have blind faith that Christianity is true. How... How, how, how could you have those? I don't think blind faith exists. Mm -hmm. Because at the very least, your faith is in the credibility of the person who told you. So for most people who have faith that Islam is true, what what's the basis for that? The, their, their father told yeah. them, their grand Same mm -hmm. thing with Christians who have blind yeah. faith. I believe it because Mamma said it. Mm -hmm. Mamma never sinned in her life, and so mm -hmm. it must be true. She wouldn't lie to me. Right. I, yeah, right. And, 
And so it's, you couldn't say it's blind faith because, because you at least have to know the, some details about Islam to be Muslim. You have to know some details. And so really you couldn't have blind faith because you're, you know, there has to be something that you've heard from someone or you would just be in complete ignorance. Um, there are, I'm sure there's some religion out there of which I'm completely ignorant of that I don't know, have any knowledge of. And so you're right. You think about having blind faith. It's someone told me this, and I believed it. No evidence required. No reasons required. And so, if how how would you ever how would you ever change your belief if it were? And that's the way that most people would think. Raise your hand if your if your parents were Christian. Raise your hand. Okay. So. Most people would say the reason why you're sitting in this room right now is because your parents were Christian. And if you were born in Saudi Arabia, where would you be at tonight? Or where would you be sitting in a Christian church? They would say, no, you would be Muslim. You'd, you would be sitting in a mosque because your parents were Muslim. And that's kind of the idea of blind faith is this is what I grew up with. This is what I was taught. And But here's the thing is... Does that mean that, that Islam is not true? Or does that mean that Christianity is not true? If that, if that is how, let's say that you, and, and probably for a lot of us as kids, it, it probably was my parents taught me that Jesus, that, that I'm a sinner, that I need to be saved, and that Christianity is true, that Christ is the only way, Christ is the Savior. If, even if you, if you never heard any evidence beyond that, does that mean that it's not true? I mean, it's either true or it's not, right? Not it, necessarily, right? So, like, mm -hmm. belief, trust, faith, all of those things are based on your experience, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, someone, if I was to try to perform uh, brain surgery, mm -hmm. right? Like, I have zero faith that that patient would get off the table. Mm -hmm. Zero, right? I have no idea. Mm -hmm. Well, you never know. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Sure. I mean, I guess I've got a full yeah. of saving this life. Yeah. But someone who has studied this, who's mm -hmm. done it before, they have done that, is that experience has given them trust in their knowledge and their tools and their techniques. And so I think that it's the, the sort of with Justin, right? Like, where there, there really is no such thing as like a blind faith. Mm -hmm. There are differing levels of faith. And that yeah. scale is based on the experiences that you choose mm -hmm. or choose not to pursue. Yeah. I think that's. I think that's true. So it, it, so if you're going to test, if someone says, I believe Islam is true, and someone else says, I believe Christianity is true, so you know, what's the next step there? And this person has a strong faith, strong belief. They've, been, they've held to the five pillars of Islam for 50 years. This person says, I believe Christianity is true. I've been a faithful Christian for 50 years. Where do you go from there in that conversation? Because they can't both be true. They make mutually exclusive claims. So, what's the, what would be the next step in that conversation? So, me personally, mm -hmm. if you're looking at me, so I assume. Oh, well, yeah, anybody, anybody could, yeah, answer yeah, that. So, um, I would. The first, I think, the first step is you take it out of the volitional argument. Mm -hmm. and you try to look at subjective arguments, right? And, and compare, yeah, uh, the statements that Islam, subjective statements that Islam, mm -hmm. that can be resisted yeah. to, to some level. I think that's a good example because what you have at that point is this person obviously wants Islam to be true and this person obviously wants Christianity, right. And that's where the question comes in of how did you come to that conclusion? On what basis did you say? And that's where the evidence comes in that you really, as it's already been mentioned here, um, it's going to come down to evidence. It's going to come down to, um, it's going to get real objective real fast because I don't know your grandmother. I don't know if she can be trusted. I don't know if, if she had good reason and, and on both sides of that. And so those subjective things have to go out the window. That's where that common ground comes in, that we're going to have to make claim, objective claims to say factual historical statements that are verified. And so, and, and ultimately, because there are, there are different claims, I mean, there are different claims. There were those in Jesus' day, those who believed he was the Son of God. The majority of people believed that he wasn't. They can't both be right. And so you're always going to have, um, you know, 
there's going to always be these competing claims that are, you're going to have to put to the test. And so, and, and I think you guys have already hit the nail on the head about, about this idea of, of the relationship between faith, reason, knowledge, and evidence. Um, look at Matthew chapter 20. Somebody uh, turn to Matthew chapter 20 and read verses, let's see, um, 17 through 19. This is going to kind of tie into um, to what we read about it, Thomas in John 21. So Matthew chapter 20, verses 17 through 19. And then somebody else turn to Matthew chapter 27 and look at verses 62 through 64. We'll start off with Matthew 20, verses 17 through 19. While going up to Jerusalem, Jesus took the twelve disciples aside privately and said to them on the way, See, we are going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death. They will hand him over to the Gentiles, be mocked, flogged, and crucified, and on the third day he will be raised. Okay. So Matthew is one of the twelve, is recording this event. And notice that it says that, that, and Jesus going up to Jerusalem took the 12 disciples apart in the way and said, he told them exactly what was going to happen. And he'll be condemned to death, delivered to the Gentiles, mocked, scourged, crucify him, and, and the third day he shall rise again. So who's included in the 12? <coughs> Who else? Matthew. Who else? Thomas. Thomas. He heard Jesus through in his own mouth. He said, I'm going to be, he told him everything, everything that he described had already happened at this point, exactly the way he described it. This is Matthew who was standing there as an eyewitness recorded that Thomas had been told by Jesus that he was, that some man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the scribes that shall condemn him to death and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to be mocked, scourged and to crucify him. All of that had occurred at this point when the disciples told told or the, the other apostles told Thomas that Jesus has, had risen from the dead. If you, if you want to there, just mark those things off, it's like so far in just based on that statement, Jesus is like five for five. He's five out of six. Whenever they tell him he's risen again after the third day and he still doesn't believe it. Even beyond that, look at somebody uh, have Matthew 27 verse 62 through 64. Listen to what this says. Now the next day, that day of the day of the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that the deceiver said, While he is yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure unto the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead. So the last error shall be worse than the first. So it, it goes even far beyond just this one statement. There's other statements in the Gospels where Jesus said that he would be crucified and that he would rise again. It is so wide known that even his enemies, even the, um, the chief priests, the Pharisees, even they had heard this claim. This is widely publicized that Jesus claimed, I will rise again after three days. So much so, that's why the guards were there. They weren't just there to protect from the body being stolen. They were there because of the claim that a resurrection is going to happen. That's how, that, that is how widely known this claim was that, Je that Jesus had claimed that he would resurrect from the dead after three days. And so when you start putting that in with Thomas rejecting this claim, um, we are getting into this idea of, of, of unbelief that it, it's not that it, even though this sounds like an unreasonable claim, look at, um, look at Acts chapter 2, verse 22. So, you know, for a, for a man to claim that he would rise again, so this, there's a context for why Jesus is rebuking Thomas. He had told Thomas personally, I will rise again. And even beyond that, going back to something Steve mentioned a minute ago, Look at yeah, Acts chapter 2, verse 22. None of this was only to produce words. This Jesus the Nazarene was a man pointed out to you by God with miracles and signs which 
those wonders and signs that God did among you through him, just as you yourselves know. Okay, so on top of the fact that Jesus said, I'm going to rise again on the third day, it's not just anybody claiming this, because that might seem like an unreasonable claim, but Jesus did claim it. But also you have, you know, where was Thomas when Jesus walked on water? Where was Thomas when Jesus fed the 5,000? Where was Thomas when he healed lepers and opened the eyes of the blind and caused the lame to walk? Where was he when he raised Lazarus? He was there witnessing all these things. And so when you put that context together, now you can see that it was... Not, you know, Thomas, it's not about blind faith. It is unreasonable for Thomas not to have believed the claims of the disciples that Christ had resurrected. When you see the full context of this, Thomas had every reason to believe that Christ had resurrected. That's how strong his unbelief was, how unreasonable his unbelief was, that he refused to believe unless he could see it with his own eyes. And so that's where that rebuke comes in. And then also you look at, as Justin mentioned there in Hebrews chapter 11, um, how many verses is Hebrews chapter 11? We read two of them. It's, 40, it's right at 40 verses. And what you have in Hebrews chapter 11 is, is the claim that early on this is to persecuted Christians or Christians who are facing persecution and basically they're being told to believe God. That they're, they're being told why, they should, why God should be trusted and clung to even in the face of persecution. And what you have there are 40 verses of historical evidence that God can be trusted. And so evidence is being given. References are being made, really covering the entire Old Testament. And so what seems like this idea of, of blind faith, that believing in things that are unseen or blessed are those who believe who have not seen, it's the same thing that, that we have the eyewitness accounts of the apostles. The same thing that, that Thomas had is what we are expected to believe. Historical evidence, eyewitness accounts, that's what we're expected to believe. And it's not a blind faith, it's a reasonable faith. But does anyone have anything to add on that before we, we move on to kind of a final point tonight? So, so knowledge is not the opposite of faith. What's the opposite of knowledge? What's the opposite of faith? Unbelief. Unbelief. So they're, they're obviously, they're not opposites, but are they the same thing? Could you know the entire Old Testament as it's pretty much summarized in Hebrews chapter 11? And can you believe that those events really happened and still not trust God? Definitely. And that's why it's not just the historical evidence that's referenced, but a plea is being made in light of all these things. Trust God. You have every reason to trust God, but you can still choose to not trust God. Um... Thinking about more in our context, could you know that Jesus died on the cross and still not believe in his death as a payment for your sin? You think about somebody like Bart Ehrman, who's an agnostic. He, I've, I, he actually has been in debates in which he was defending, number one, the existence of Jesus, number two, the fact that he, that he died on a Roman cross. And he does not believe that that, that death on the cross was was in any way atoning, could be atoning for his sin and the payment for his sin. But he does believe that Jesus was crucified on a Roman cross. He believes that is a historical, factual statement. It is a fact of history that Jesus died on a Roman cross. He knows that Jesus died on the cross, but he does not believe in his death as the payment for his sin. That's where this idea um, here at the end of this chapter is the difference between belief that and belief in. Um, you can, and what it comes down to is you have to start with, with knowledge and reason. If, I can tell you this, if Jesus never lived, he's not your savior. There has to be, there ha it has to be factual, you have to begin with knowledge and reason that Jesus really did live, he really did live, live for 30, 33 years, lived, lived a perfect life, died upon a cross, for your sin in order to be your savior those facts of history have to be true if jesus never lived he can't be your savior so it starts with knowledge and reason but that is not enough knowing that jesus lived and died is not the same thing as trusting in him his life and his death trusting in him for salvation or following him um and notice i say you know not just not just not that you trusted in him but that you are trusting in him continuously 
And again, I think as it's been pointed out, I think Brian pointed it out, that this is not, you're not agreeing that, the, that these statements are factual. It goes beyond that. I mean, you can, you know, intellectually, you can say, yes, I think this really occurred. I think this really happened. It goes beyond that. This is not an act of the, of the mind. It is an, an intellectual assent, but it is an act of the will or the heart to actually believe. That's the difference between believing, yes, that this happened, and believing, believing that Jesus died on the cross and believing in his death for salvation. Um, any other thoughts on that, on that distinction? I like the analogy of the roller coaster. Mm -hmm. Because I know that Michael Davis is a very smart young man. And that he knows that all the principles of mechanical engineering assure him mm -hmm. that he will not die mm -hmm. on that roller coaster. He has seen a thousand people get on that roller coaster and get off that roller coaster. He has never seen one get on that didn't get on. Mm -hmm. He still ain't getting on. Yeah. <laughs> it yep. still ain't going to happen. Yep. Nope. He believes that he will live. He yeah. believes in he will live. There's a big difference. Yeah. There's a big difference. Um, I think the example used in the book is that, you know, believing that someone will make a good spouse um, is different from marrying them. I mean, you can, I can factually say, you know, I see, I, I'll go down the list of what are the attributes of a, of, of a woman that would be a good wife. You check all those boxes. That's completely different from, from proposing and marrying someone. Um, that's the difference between believing that someone would be a good spouse and believing in them, putting your trust in them. Um, and that's, there is a drastic difference. And we are not called, you have to do the first to get to the second if, you, if you're going to be consistent. But just doing, you know, just checking the boxes is not the same thing as trusting in someone. And that's what we're called to be. When we put our faith in Christ, it is not our, not our faith about Him, but our faith in Him. Um, there, and there is an enormous difference. It's that big of a difference between believing, like I said, someone would make a good spouse and then actually marrying someone, putting your trust in them. Any other questions or comments on this? Anything from the author? So blind faith would be the equivalent of marrying them without checking any of the boxes. I done seen, yeah. Yeah. An arranged marriage, yeah. Um, and you may get lucky. You may you may marry the best spouse of the I mean Yeah. There's a blind date is dependent on the credibility of my mother who set it up. Right. And so it you've got a one in about three point five billion chance of marrying the absolute best spouse on the face of the earth. And you may get lucky. And, there, and that's what I, I like that, that term, and I've used that quite a bit uh, since, since reading the book here, the idea of an accidental Christian, that, you know, living in America, you could get lucky and, and, and truly put your faith in Christ and not never check out the claims, never put it to the test, and, but you're not so lucky if you're in Saudi Arabia or if you're in any part of North Africa or any part of the Muslim world, Indonesia. Um, and that's where... Reasonable faith is what we need to have a reason for the hope that lies within us as we're commanded to do. We, and you know, as we said earlier, you can't argue someone into heaven. You also cannot preach someone into heaven. You also cannot pray someone into heaven. You also cannot love someone into heaven. But we're called to do all of those things, to preach, to pray, to love, to, to give a reason for the hope that lies within us, to make sound arguments. We're called to do all of those things as Christians. Um, and I like how this, this chapter ends. The quote there on page 47 um, if you uh, look there at that last bullet, uh, second sentence, it says, First, without the work of God, nothing else will work. Not arguments, not love, not even the simple gospel. An unbelieved gospel can't save anybody. The person doesn't really believe and trust in it, trust in what, what, what's being told to them. So first, without the work of God, nothing else will work. Not arguments, not love, not even the simple gospel. Second, with the help of the Holy Spirit, God is pleased to use many things. Love and reason are especially appealing to Him because both are consistent with His nature. The fact is, with God's help, arguments work all the time. Jesus used them. And that's, that's probably your greatest you know, argument against not using arguments is Jesus made arguments. Um, it, John 14, 11, He said, If you don't believe me, believe me, believe me for the very work's sake. He was, that was part of His argument to prove that He was Messiah. He knows that He's coming into a world of deception. He doesn't expect people to take His word for the fact that He is the Son of God and that He'll rise again on the third day. There is, there's three years of evidence 
And he says he appeals to those works as the evidence for believing him. But Jesus used them, Peter used them, Paul used them, all to great effect. And so love and reason, especially um, appealing to God because they are consistent with his nature. So, um, you know, all these things coming together, um, that, that it's a reasonable faith. That's what we're after. And again, that's also tied into what we've talked about these past two weeks about helping people understand the gospel. And as you explain it, we don't have anything to be afraid of with this, of objections and things like that, because it's consistent. It makes perfect sense that our, putting our faith in Christ is the most reasonable thing we can do based upon the evidence that, that's been made available to us. But any other questions or comments tonight before we wrap up? Good, yeah. And, uh, but it's about his church. Mm-hmm. And uh, we drove 60 miles, it was, uh, to a church that we finally found that was really, I think, I think they were uh, a gospel preaching. Mm-hmm. Uh, church, but in the snow in the wintertime, it wasn't a good place to yeah. go to. Uh, but uh, but we, we went there every time we had an opportunity, we were 60 miles away. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, all these events, I go on and on with the things. Mm-hmm. Uh, went to a church over in North Carolina. Statement was, you let one of them long haired hippies come into this church, and I'll be the first one to push them out of the window. Hmm. Well, that's the gospel. Mm-hmm. That particular Baptist yeah. church. And then I go on and on. Mm-hmm. We learned a lot. And uh, uh, I'm thankful for all those things. Yeah. I learned, and I'm thankful for the events yeah. and the, the circumstances. But, uh, but it taught, it taught us some things that we had never learned. Mm-hmm. And we know I left here. Yeah. One step at a time, we began to uh, sort out what it took to be a Christian. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, I think the things we learned through that process. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I'm, I'm personally thankful for it. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I think we've been a, just a typical Sunday morning Christian mm-hmm. uh, church goer, and that's been the whole thing we've ever been. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, God gave us the privilege, and uh, I, I've had the privilege to win. Uh, I don't know how many people to Christ, mm-hmm. and, and every, every one of them was a, just another experience. Yeah. Different than all the others. Each one was different. Mm-hmm. And, uh, God really gave us a tremendous amount of uh, opportunity over the years. Mm-hmm. And uh, just uh, uh, things I've seen that uh, lives have changed 
Mm -hmm. And the change that comes out of those lives is just phenomenal. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, I, with all those things, I tie in with a lot of stuff right, right here because uh, you, you can have a, you can have a, a Christian faith, I guess you saw it, you can call it, but it can be a very, very watered down Christian faith. Yeah. So yeah. I, I just yeah. add more to that, but that, that's just a very, very simple way of saying that, that had we not got away from here and seen things different we saw here. Because mm -hmm. Things here that going back now looking at it, I think, boy, we being misled. Yeah, I understand. And I thank God for what He's done. For yeah, us. yeah, that's. I think that's the biggest difference for, that you see in a person's life is, you know, if belief that Jesus rose from the dead um, doesn't really have any bearing on your life. But when you believe in the resurrection of Christ, it, believe in Him, the One who resurrected, it completely transforms your life. And it, it's it's very easy to fall into that first category. I mean, and you go undetected because I can remember growing up, you know, it's like pray for, pray, you know, pray for this one guy. He's like the, the one atheist in the entire neighborhood, you know, and you think, I mean, and you need to pray for someone, but what about, what about the, the other, you know, 100 people that claim to know Christ and has no bearing on their life whatsoever? They're just as lost as this guy is that they, they, they wouldn't, they would never come out and say, I don't think that Jesus rose from the dead, but Monday morning, Monday afternoon, Monday night says they don't think he rose from the dead. They don't. They're not. They 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 see no need to obey what he said. How can you believe someone rose from the dead and they're the Son of God and you don't, you know, and, and you would say, yeah, he's the Lord, but you don't do anything that he says. And so it, I mean, that's just as much unbelief, but it tends to go. It's not as detected as someone who says, I don't think any of that ever even happened. You know, they they're rejecting that it happened. And so all the all the bells and whistles go off, the sirens go off. This person said, oh, I believe that it happened, but they're not trusting in, in, in the one who did it at all. And so um, that's what we need to really have. I think that's good to think about tonight. I'm glad we're going over this because we need to not just be satisfied with someone saying, oh, yeah, I think, or, or, are you a Christian? Yeah, I'm a Christian. Okay, that means you believe, you're claiming that you believe that Jesus rose from the dead, but you know, you have to, it, it, it'll be deeper if you believe, if you really believe in Christ who rose from the dead. But anybody else got a comment tonight? Anything from the author you'd like to add in, clarify, correct? You did a better job explaining than I could. I don't think so. Read the chapter. Uh, I stumbled through it tonight. Read the chapter. Yeah, I, I just think it's so true. I think uh, a lot of good comments. Is, uh, trust, belief, faith uh, is not opposed to uh, it's not opposed to, you know, work and activity and obedience and all that. It's, you know, so long as we're doing it not for salvation, that we're doing it. But if you believe somebody and you trust somebody, you know they have your best welfare at heart, then, you know, if they're, if they're an authority figure and they give you a command, you're going to obey them. Um... And so the, there is this element of obedience, and we'll get into it mm -hmm. in other chapters, that our lives, if we are trusting, trust is not, you know, we've got to get away from all that, just, oh, it's an intellectual, you got to believe A, B, C, and D. Mm -hmm. Well, there are some doctrines we do have to, some basic ones that we do need to believe. But basic, but trusting and, and, and believing in, it, it, it involves more than that and um, you know like uh, a Naaman that had leprosy in the Old Testament you know he went to uh, was it Elijah or Elisha he went to I can't remember I think it's Elisha I think all right so well I've already started <laughs> go ahead I'll so, clarify it so Naaman was was told to go dip it's got a sippy cup <laughs> So Naaman was told to go dip in the river seven mm -hmm. times, wasn't he? Right. For so for him to do that, he had to be trusting that what was being told to him was true. He had to so he had to put his trust and subject himself to that. Mm -hmm. And so um, when we live a, a life of obedience to Christ, you know that's. That's because we're trusting him. We're, we're, we're following him. He, we know that he knows what is best for us. He's our authority. He has our best welfare at heart. So it goes trust, 
usually ends up if there's that trusting relationship it's going if that is re really genuine trusting relationship is there it's going to manifest itself in doing things doing certain mm -hmm. activities um, you know Jesus says why do you call me Lord Lord and not do the things I do mm -hmm. right so um, that trust element to it it does involve act it's not just some intellectual things I have to agree to it does involve actually obeying because that's an element of trust uh, is, is obedience so and we are to not only start our life with Christ in, in trust but we we it's a lot a life of continually to trust in him mm -hmm. and uh, and that will manifest itself as Bill's talking about in if you're really trusting in something you're you're going to subject yourself to it you're mm -hmm. going to follow it yeah you're going to do it uh, so that becomes an evidence of the genuineness of your faith. So that's Man. all. Yeah, that's good. That. Anybody else? You know, so we, we come away with some things that I'd have liked, you know. Don't, don't just take for granted if someone says they're a Christian or that that, that they affirm certain things. That, you know that Christianity is true. You know that they believe in God. Um, you know, think about that as far as when we witness to people, share the gospel, but also, you know, apply to yourself as you leave here tonight that um, you claim that that you know Jesus is your Savior and Lord. Um, you know, does the evidence line up with that claim um, when you leave here? How you conduct yourself tomorrow, how I conduct myself tomorrow, um, you know, will will the evidence line up with that? Um, are we subjecting ourselves to Christ, and is He is He the one leading us, or are we doing our own thing while claiming to be following Him, go, while going our own way? So um, these are some pretty simple concepts when you think about it, but um, they definitely have a profound effect on your life. Would someone like to close us in prayer or not?